Good evening, everyone. I'm standing here with the Benny Glow Massif behind me up here. And I want to just tell you a wee story. I set off yesterday to go and climb the Massif. And in my normal way, I take my camera with me and head off up there. It was quite a struggle because the wind was particularly severe as I get, got up towards the top of, of the ridge. And I told the stories as I went along the way and then I came down again last night and got home. And wh what I found on the tapes, there was no sound. And the old tradition, there's a witch that lives up there, Kilak Nan Bo, woman of the cows. And when I told my brother this story, he said, she strikes again, she's got you. So she's probably an incarnation of the pre-Christian earth goddess <clears throat> who could appear as an old hag, a beautiful young woman, or a cow, sometimes referred to in tradition as the goddess of winter and the bringer of storms. The word Kielik from Old Gallic, from Veiled One, notice the link with the name of the hill, and in modern Gallic it usually refers to an old woman. So what I'm going to do now is talk you through the stories that I told and I am going to then overlay the videos that I took that don't have any soundtracks with the stories. Last week I went up Ben Vraki and under lockdown we were allowed to stay within a five mile radius of where we live. So I cast around to look for something else that I could do and go and see. And I thought, why not go um, up Benny Glow and this massif behind me here? And so that was my objective. It's over 3,000 feet. The farm that we can see up in the background here is um, where my late friend John Cameron used to live. His son Rory now runs the farm. And, my, and so I've known this massif for a good number of years. And I thought it would be very appropriate um, to talk about it. I then did a little bit of research and my guidebook tells me this is in the centre of two peaks of the ben, Benny Glow Massif. And more precisely, Khan Leith, um, or the grey or grizzled pile of stones. And that is the bit with the, the track that's going up the side. And that's Khan Leith I decided that I'd walk up. And it's literally a short distance from my home in Kilikranki. As we walk along, on the left-hand side, there are hut circles. And those of you who followed my talk on Ben Vraki will know about hut circles. They tended to come from the Bronze Age, which was 2500 BC. To 800 BC. There's a burial mound. Burial cairns date primarily from the Neolithic period and from early Bronze Age and that's from 8000 BC to 800 BC. So people were living up here in, at that time. Farming um, started to take place 7000 years ago. So it's interesting where, where we are today. So these um, Neolithic burial ground that I started to talk to you about um, was from 8000 to 800 BC and Loch Morag deserted settlement is on the right hand side as we walk up here we're told it comprises of the remains of post medieval depopulated settlement Kiernan Namwain we believe translates as favorite peat bog and so that was what that settlement was called. It consists of four farmsteads and an enclosure within a surrounding head dike. So this settlement would have been relative, relatively recent. Ahead of us there was a shielding hut and it's called Kokna Krov, Hillock of the Trees. I apologize for my terrible Gaelic. That's where those shillings were. And shillings 
is a traditional practice mainly involving women and children moving the livestock to the high ground to live there for the summer. The huts were temporary huts, generally for summer purposes only. They would make butter and cheese and store them cleats. Doing my research for this, it made me realize how recent a phenomenon hill walking is today. It's a really a modern past pastime. We've only just started doing this as we've had more leisure time and have become more affluent. Let me just take you through some categories of hills. Monroe. What is a Monroe? And why is it called a Monroe? Thanks to Wilderness Scotland's website, I find the following. Monroes are named after Sir Hugh Monroe, who in 1891 defined all mountains over 3,000 feet in Scotland in an article in the Scottish Mountaineering Club magazine. 1891, today 130 years, and not a long time. And I'll, I'll quote what the bit from the article that's on the Wilderness Scotland's website. His original list was made up of 538 summits, with 282 being Monroes. It is not clear when these mountains first became known as Monroes, but popularization of the Monroe bagging seems to have started with the publication of a book by Hamish Brown, Hamish's Mountain Walk in 1974. It documented his four-month self-propelled journey, apart from some ferry crossings, around all the Monroes in Scotland. So 1974, what are we talking about? 50 years ago, less than 50 years ago. By the 1980s, Monroe bagging was becoming a very popular hobby. So much so, there was even a BBC series called The Monroe Show, presented in a light-hearted manner by Muriel Gray in the early 1990s. Many found the pronunciations of the tricky mountain names which I have stumbled on by Sawley MacLean, a great poet from Rasse, very memorable. The first person to complete the Munros is said to be Reverend A. E. Robertson of Rannoch, which is not too far from here, and he did this in 1901. But there is some doubt if he did them all. The first confirmed completion, plus the tops, was in 1923, which is just about a hundred years ago, by Ronald Byrne. Today, there are still 282 Munros. Those people who set out to climb all of them are Monroe bagging. Those who achieve this are called completists or Monroeists. It is estimated there are over 6,000 people who have done this. There are also two other hill categories, Corbett's and Graham's. Well, I'd heard of Corbett's and these are hills between 2,500 feet and 3,000 feet, or 762 meters and 914 meters. And they were named after John Rook Corbett. Like Sir Hugh Munro, he was also a member of the Scottish Mountaineering Club between the two world wars. And he climbed all the hills in Scotland over 2,000 feet, and in 1930, completed all the Munro tops. Only the second person to do so there are currently 222 Corbett's. Graham's. Graham's are, are hills between 2,000 and 2,499 feet or 610 meters and 761 meters with a drop of 150 meter between them. They used to be known as lesser Corbett's but the name Graham was conferred on, on them in memory of Fiona Torbett, nay Graham, who published her own list of these hills in 1992. And there are currently 219 Grahams. So 1992 to, to the, we're now 2020, you know, we're talking about under 30 years, all very recent. I'd also like to just end with this distinction of different, different hill types using a quote from Wilderness Scotland's website. And they say, but the best advice is to forget all the classifications and look at the hills and their own merits, as all three hill types all offer
some cracking days out and this is you know I would really endorse that it's not about trying to gain medals or anything like that it's about choosing a hill going up it safely and preparing yourself properly This is a story that was collected in 1836 by a William Scrope. William Scrope wrote mainly about his deer stalking exploits and was accompanied on these by John Crera, who had entered the Duke's service in 1776. Mr. Scrope, however, was also enthralled by the local stories recounted to him by the local Gallic speaking men who accompanied him and assisted him in his deer stalking exploits. He recounts how these men's English had been improved by their interaction with many of these sportsmen. One of these stories is about being aglow up behind us here, and, a, and it's about a strange encounter between some would be deer poachers and a strange lady. In Gallic tradition the earth goddess was often mischievous and capricious uh, as is the weather in Scotland and you have to remember the old Gallic culture was full of superstition. So the last recorded mortal conversation which, with the witch of Bienaglo. This is the same witch my brother tells me made sure that these recordings didn't have any soundtrack on them and that's why I'm having to do this recording separately. In the year 1773 two poachers set out from Braemar. On the way they were overtaken by a storm which soon cleared and they headed towards Athol which seemed a clearer route. After a lot of effort they wounded a hind and had to track her for a long distance in the snow. Towards the end of the day the wind rose and it started snowing again. By this time they were lost. They heaped up some stones as a windbreak and ate some oat cakes and drank some whiskey, wrapped themselves in their plaids and slept comfortably. They woke at dawn, however the wind was still howling and they could see no landmarks. The deer was forgotten, they were now afraid for their lives. They knew the wind was about from the north, so headed downwind hoping to end up in Glen Tilt. However, the snow mounted up and there's only one route open to them which they took. Eventually, as once again night was falling, they entered a dark, joyless looking glen. They thought would have to spend another night in their plaids and began looking about for some stones to build a windbreak. To their great relief, they came upon a summer sheiling and expecting it to be empty as it was suddenly winter, they were surprised when a woman of a wild and haggard aspect opened the door and said she had been expecting them and their supper and beds were ready. There was a fire and the pot was boiling and there were hot bannocks and oat cakes on the table. The two men sat and felt mesmerized by the woman. She had large features, long lank hair and small grey eyes deeply sunk and conveyed a striking expression of vice and cunning. She stood on one leg and chanted a wild song in an unknown language as she prepared their supper. The two men were tired and exhausted but so frightened they could hardly eat. The woman waved her long sinewy arms and told them she had power over the wind and the storm and muttered some strange unintelligible sentences. She then held up a rope with three knots in it. If I untie the first knot there will be a fair wind such as any deer stalker would wish for. If I loosen the second 
the wind will grow stronger and sweep over the hills. If I untie the last knot, there will be a storm such as you've never seen, and I'll guide its course from my home on Kanan Nachbar. If you want to thrive, you must place a nice fat hind by Fraser's Cairn at midnight on the first Monday of every month. If not, you will perish in the wastelands and the ravens will pick out your eyes and the eagle will pick over your bones. The terrified men quickly agreed to the bargain that there is no word as, well as to whether they stuck to it. They were allowed to pass the night in sleep and when they awoke they were alone, they rose from their heather beds. The weather was pleasant and they easily found their way to Blair. This is the last time we know that the Kiernan Nanbo had word with mortal men, except of course tampering with my video footage. So it was an absolutely wonderful walk and again this evening here, the day after, it's again beautiful. It looks so pleasant. But when I got up there yesterday, the wind was incredible. And so with hills over 3,000 feet and even lesser hills, the weather conditions can change from being on the ground level up to the top. So always make sure you're well prepared and, and enjoy your hill walking. I made the decision to not go down that other face because I just felt the wind was too bad. So what I'm going to do is walk around and come down this face here and down that way. I think that's going to be easier. I think that's the top up here somewhere, but anyway, this is away from all the wind, and I think it'll be a much safer way down. There's still a lot of sunshine left, being in June, we're a couple of days off, longest day, so I'll take my time and try and be, make as safe as I can. chosen the side that's in the shelter of the wind so it's much more peaceful yes I'm not following, following a path but I'm coming down carefully gently away from the risk of being blown over literally just looking back from where I've come I'm just going to go pan down Look, Moring. That's where I'm going. going down here gently and round again. Just a lovely, lovely view. Tracks, I'm assuming they must be made by deer. There are a number of them around the hillside here. Here we have a little stream coming off the mountainside. And down. I'll probably follow that. You can see I've lost a lot of height coming gum from right up there and I'm just going to pan round through the heather here and you'll see the lie of the land are much lower down now I've taken the real sting out of coming down the hill and thank goodness away from all that wind yeah this is much easier now and heading off in the direction of Loch Marie and hopefully if we're lucky we might see some wildlife we've seen one month 
bunch of hair already. But whether there's more, we'll see. That little river, or stream we saw at the beginning, is gathered some force. You can see it just there. Looking back, come down really from up there, down and then follow this wee burn round. Certainly a lot safer than coming down that face and that path in that severe wind. Lower down, beautiful, beautiful evening. Heading on down. Here's our stream again, another bit, a bit more water coming above the surface, no doubt to disappear again further down. A few more sheep there, the first ones I've seen, or the second lot I've seen, Malachmary over the top there, and I'm probably going to head to the hut, just to realise the hut is there where I went up carnally. So that's my way out, I think. As I sit here having my cup of tea, I thought I'd actually pan round and show you and point out the different things that I can see in the evening sunlight. It's the end of June and you can't get better light than this. And it's about eight o'clock at night. Up there is Ben Vraki, a hill behind Pitlochry that I walked the other day. And you can see these magnificent stone walls again, which were built in the 1800s. Panning around, the next hill we can see up there is the hill, hill where the Battle of Kilikranki took place on the, on the far side. The pass of Kilikranki will be just down there to the left of that. And I'll keep panning around. And there are various hills which I'm not sure about. Down there will be the glen which goes up to Blair Athol. And the hill that's coming into view up here is Shihalin. And then down here will be Blair, Blair Athol. The Gamokta Pass, I suspect, is up there somewhere, up to Inverness. Glen Tilt will be down here. Beautiful. Just wanted to look at these stone walls. Magnificent, aren't they? You know, built probably 150, 200 years ago. You know, again we come to another stone wall here. Long straight stone wall. Incredible, isn't it? I must try and do something to find out a bit more about the stone wall builders of previous years. I think you can actually see a wind farm right over there. They're very well hidden, these wind farms, generating much needed power. I live just over the top of that hill there, in Killycranky. I suspect that's the road here that's got a, a fawn there. I've found in the past, if I just stand still, it's almost as if they don't see me. Well, 
that's where I went up. A lot of wind. And I went up that, that way and I came down there. Out of the wind. It's a beautiful evening. Absolutely beautiful. I'm just... It's probably about nine o'clock now. And I'm just taking my time. I've called home. Let my wife know what's going on. And this evening light, just beautiful. It's around here that I saw the roe deer. You can see down here the water is lying. It's much more peaty. And no doubt in times past, the when times are much, much harder than now, people would have dug from bogs like this for their fuel and all the peat. It's also a place where many artifacts have been found because the peat soil preserves it all. Beautiful evening. Look. Isn't he magnificent? Never seen a bird as magnificent as that. He obviously feels I'm a threat. Beautiful. What a stunning bird to see. Thank you. watching me too. Just snort through his nose. That was the alarm to the youngster. Can't understand why I'm here. Here comes the next one. The alarm's gone. Yep, there's a bloody human here. Did you notice how they snorted? Off they go. Look who's sitting there. Looking at me, these meadow pipits are lovely. They're almost like a companion as you're walking in the hills. Just watching carefully, see what I'm up to.